Welcome, welcome, patrons. Do you like movies? What about anime? Perhaps Seether? Well, if you said yes to any of those, let's have a chat about the only Dragon Age feature film, Dawn of the Seeker, which tells the story on how Cassandra became the right hand of the divine. Context. This movie was released on February 11th, 2012, about a year after Dragon Age 2 was released. This seems like a long time after the game was released, but let's just take a step back from our North American-centered view. This movie is actually aimed towards the Japanese market and made for a Japanese audience. Its timing also makes much more sense when you consider that Dragon Age 2's Japanese dub was released on February 2nd, 2012. The original language for the movie was Japanese, and an English version wasn't released until about a month later on March 11th, 2012. In Japanese, the title is actually translated as Dragon Age Crusade of the Blood Mage. I don't actually know that much about Japan, but from what I've read and heard, the Japanese voice cast is actually pretty star-studded. Cassandra is played by a famous actress who is in Juon, or the original Grudge, or for us in the West, she also played Gogo in Kill Bill. The Blood Mage Fenric is voiced by a well-known voice actor known as the dub for C-3PO in Japan, and the voice of Julius in Cowboy Bebop. The voice for the Divine is another well-known voice actress who voiced Hild in Oh My Goddess. That's... I liked Oh My Goddess as a kid. I don't know if anyone else gets that reference, but I thought that was interesting. Anyway, and Knight Commander Martell was voiced by Gact, who I guess is a very famous Japanese singer and actor, but I honestly have not actually heard of him until right now, but he apparently is very large in Japan. He also has a song in the credits of the movie. Left to go. In comparison, the English voice cast is pretty much just anime voice actor veterans. Not to belittle their accounts, but they're definitely not the star-studded cast like it is in Japan. Weirdly enough, they didn't actually get Cassandra's actual voice actress to voice her, but I imagine that has something to do with contracts, and that's just another story. Now, a lot of the information on this movie is in Japanese, which I do not speak or know how to read, but from what I can gather, it seems that Mike Laidlaw, then creative director for Dragon Age, and Mark Dara, then Bioware's executive director, did help in the creation process for the movie. From a production update that was released in January 2012, it seems that Funimation was actually the ones to ask to do a movie for Dragon Age, and this was their first feature film. Now, it does seem that there are some slight edits from the English and the Japanese version, they aren't that big of a deal, I don't think it really matters in the end which version you watch, although me not being able to understand the language, I think it actually helped me take some of the lines more seriously. Although, curiously, the Japanese version I watched didn't have the lip movement synced as they did in the English version, which the English was close, but also still not great on it either. The animation itself is unique, I guess. I don't really think the 3D cell shaded look is that great, and I'm not a fan of the anime style with the big guy. I'm just not. But maybe someone will like it. Some of the character designs are just odd too and feel out of place with the rest of the world. You can tell that there is some overlap with the Dragon Age assets as some outfits do appear in the series, but where the animators seem to take their own designs, it really shows and just feels out of place for me. Now there did appear to be some problems with the film in production as it was set to come out actually a few months earlier than it did, but the reason for the delay was never actually explained. We do know that things were cut out of the film, like Avex is talking, so perhaps the delay was in editing, but overall we just don't really know. This was, again, apparently Funimation's first full-length film, so perhaps it was just an inexperienced company's first time and they overestimated themselves. Now that's the real world context, let's talk about the game context, which there's really not that much of. The movie is set when Cassandra is young, about the year 922 Dragon. So for context, this is about eight years before Dragon Age Origins, and Cassandra is about 19 to 20 years old. When this movie was first released, they never actually said when this was stated, so a lot of fans thought it might be set right at Dragon Age 2, or a little bit before, a little bit after. Not eight years before the main game. So there was a lot of confusion about this movie coming out. Dawn of the Seeker we start out with a little background information on the world of Thetis because you know anyone watching this movie doesn't know anything about the series. Oddly enough, when I was watching the Japanese version, this was actually delivered in English. The only question I have is that it mentions a gathering of the faithful and Drostians that happens every 10 years in Orlais, which I don't think we have ever heard of until now or even after this movie. Anyway, the actual movie starts with sexy blood mages that seem to not really have a part in the actual event, which is getting blood from a dragon and forcing a little elven girl, Avexis, to drink it. We have our main antagonist, Brother Fenric, who doesn't look evil at all, give a small speech about how the time of blood mages is about to begin. 
We cut to a group of Seekers who are riding to confront the mages, and the Seeker Byron tells a young Cassandra, oh my god, that's Cassandra? Anyway, he tells her to keep her fury in check. They then attack the group of blood mages who do really nothing to defend themselves. Cassandra goes on a murder rampage, this weird blood effect just happens, then Fenric tells his people to release the dragon. Cassandra kills it. When Fenric is trapped holding a Vexus, he knows he is outmatched and turns into a raven flying away, leaving the girl behind. We cut to the Grand Cathedral where Cassandra, Byron, and the High Seeker Aldrin meet Divine Beatrix III. She tells him that she is disturbed about the Blood Mage meeting happening so close to the Gathering. We learn that Avexus was actually kidnapped from the Circle of Magi and is not actually a Blood Mage. The High Seeker says that she will be in their custody for now, as she seems to be important for whatever the Blood Mages are planning. One of the Grand Clerics asks if Cassandra really killed a Drake, with others in the room gossiping about how she is part of the Pentagos clan, famed for their dragon hunting. We get a sarcastic comment from Knight Commander Martell saying that the Seekers should have let the Templars help in the matter, as the Seekers are so small, things could have gone wrong. The High Seeker and the Knight Commander argue a bit before being interrupted by the Grand Cleric. We then cut to Cassandra in the Seeker's base, beating the shit out of a dummy as Byron watches. The two have a friendly duel, and can we just talk about how out of character it feels for young Cassandra to be fighting in a miniskirt? I just don't really see her fighting in a miniskirt. Anyway, Byron wins the duel, tells her that even if he bested her, she's the best seeker with a blade because he knows she was holding back. And she shouldn't be so prejudiced against mages, and the movie flat out tells us they have a father-daughter relationship. I must sound just like a father lecturing his child. I'd be proud to have you as a father. We catch a Fenric telling another hooded person that they need to get Avexus back, but it's dangerous to keep meeting a person. So he hands him a rare elven stone to talk through. After a fire transition, we watch as Cassandra's older brother gets cut down by a mage on horseback. It's a nightmare! Cassandra hears walking outside her room and finds Byron stalking the halls. She follows him down to the dungeons where he is carrying out Avexus. He tells her that she never saw anything and that she should go back. But she doesn't, follows him out, pleading to know what's going on. He just says that he's doing an important mission just as the alarm is raised that someone stole Avexus. As Raven Fenric watches. Byron and Cassandra run with a knocked out Avexus through the woods, which really it's been at least 24 hours since this poor girl has been knocked out. There has to be something medically wrong with her, but we're just gonna ignore that. A seeker is back at camp, knows Cassandra and Byron and give chase. Byron tells Cassandra that they will wait at a tree, and he explains that he doesn't actually know the details, but there is a conspiracy going on, and that the High Seeker might be involved. Cassandra is shocked, but Byron goes on to say that Avexus is special, as she has the ability to control animals, which is why the Blood Mages wanted her, although he doesn't know why yet. The two argue a bit, and finally Byron says that he has taken the girl to a friend he can trust. Before Cassandra can find out who that is, a flock of ravens fly overhead, transforming into more blood mages. Byron says that they should run, but Cassandra attacks them, and when she's about to be outnumbered, Byron dives in front of her to save her life. Fenric then takes Avexus away from a dying Byron. The blood mages hear the other seekers coming, and then they disappear. Somehow. Cassandra rushes over to a dying Byron, and he tells her that she must save the Chantry by getting the girl back. With his last breath, he tells this wonderfully written line. Hate can only breed more hate. Then dies. Cassandra then senses something and spies a man hiding behind a tree. He then runs away with Cassandra tackling and trying to attack him, the man calling out that he wasn't with the blood mages. This is Regalian de Marcal, a circle mage. Cassandra calls out that he is still a mage and goes to attack him, but then they are interrupted by the rest of the Seekers catching up to them. They question what happened and why she took Avexes, but she says nothing. When the Seekers call out for her and Regalian to be captured, she tries to say that they need to get Avexes back to save the Chantry. The other Seeker rightfully tells her it's a kind of late for that, and her and the mage are tied up. While tied up and just standing around the woods for some reason, Regalian tells Cassandra that he was Byron's contact to take Avexes. Cassandra is still angry at him for just being a mage, but he tells her that the Circle Mages are with the Chantry and don't assume he's just a bad guy. Cassandra asks if he really knows how to find Avexus. He says yes, and she calls out that Regalian has a knife. When the Seekers get closer to get the knife, she attacks them, grabs an actual knife, and runs away. In some sort of safety, Regalian calls out to her to slow down as they are attached by chains. They trip. This happens. Ugh. She's unable to free herself and threatens Regalian to find the blood mages that killed Byron. We cut to the High Seeker informing the Divine on what has happened. 
Night Commander says that he is able to dispatch people immediately, so the Divine makes the order, as the Seekers might have a conflict of interests. Back to Cassandra, Regalian points out a circle safe house, which seems like something the Chantry wouldn't condone, but okay. The two argue about trust, that Byron trusts in him, and he is a spy for the Chantry to find blood mages, blah blah blah, but then Cassandra notices that the horses outside of the circle safe house are uneasy. They rush to the house to find people dead inside, and worse, a drawn image. They end up finding one survivor, a man named Haiti, and questions him. He is able to tell them that they were caught by blood mages after returning from Lazaro's. Then he dies. Cassandra questions who Lazaro is, and Regalian says that he is an information trader who told them of the dragon ritual. Cassandra wants to go see him, but he says that the blood mages might already be there. She then frees him and tells him that he should be ready. Traveling most of the night on horseback, a voiceover of the two talking lets us know more about Regalian. He is a part of a network that keeps track of rogue mages to help the circle. A quick back to the High Seeker being informed that they can't find Cassandra, and then back to First Enchanter Edmund being informed that they haven't had word of Regalian and that he must be found before the Templars or Seeker find them. Then we go all the way back to Cassandra and Regalian looking up a cliff, with Regalian saying that Lazaro is a mad elven man that lives on the cliff face. Cassandra asks how to get in, and they begin to climb. They find the hut empty and trash until Lazaro jumps on Cassandra, attempting to kill her. Cassandra gets the better of him and asks what he's going on, and Regalian tells her to calm down, but she doesn't and threatens to cut off his ear. Lazaro finally tells her that Fenric has a Vexus and that he's the leader of the Blood Mages, and that he will be attacking the Ten Year Gathering using a Vexus's power. He also has a contact high up in the Chantry, but claims not to know who that is. He tries to throw what is basically a flash bomb, but Regalian catches him. Azara yells that he was going to be killed and that he was to alert the blood mages if they showed up. But it's too late. They already know. The house begins to shake and then an ogre comes out from the floorboards and kills Lazaro. Cassandra wounds it just as it falls out of the home, taking most of the hut with it. Somehow alive and mostly unharmed, our heroes find a mass of ogres and golems surrounding them, slaves to blood magic. Cassandra fights them as Regalian yells out that there's just too many. She fights on, is knocked out of the air, and knocked out by a gash on her thigh, which is why you shouldn't wear a miniskirt to a fight. But and before she's sliced by an ogre's sword, which I think is the first time we've actually seen an ogre with a weapon, but that's another story, Regalian save her and runs using the flash bomb to get away. We cut to the two of them living through the forest. Cassandra complains that she should be able to walk through the pain and yells at him for wanting to heal her with magic. But then in a moment where the two needs to start falling in love, she apologizes and explains that she doesn't like to admit that she is in his debt. And Regalian asks her to stop calling him mage. But then the Templars come and catch him. This time it's Regalian's turn to save the day, and somehow these two limping is faster than a bunch of Templars on horseback and running. They are chased to a cliff edge and Cassandra wants to jump, saying that it will be for the Maker to decide if they survive. Then she pushes them over. They land in the river below, which, if we're going to be real here, should have killed them, but this is an anime movie, so they come out of it fine, with Cassandra only mildly in a coma. We cut to the Grand Cathedral where the Divine looks out. A Grand Cleric, whose name we never actually find out despite being a very major character, but we do know from the critics her name is Callista, tells her that things are going well with the plans for the gathering. We also learn that she is currently the right hand of the Divine. We then cut back to Cassandra and Ergalian, who have taken shelter in a cave. He heals her leg in, I guess, what is supposed to be mildly romantic because it's her upper thigh. He tells her that he is best at healing spells and uses a leaf or something. And there's some minor sexual tension in which Cassandra awkwardly brings up her brother, which somehow seems the most in-character moment for her so far. She tells him that her brother Anthony was murdered by blood mages when she was a kid. Blood mages needed dragon's blood for some whatever and come looking for her brother, an unmatched dragon hunter. Anthony refused to kill a dragon for them, so they killed him and her uncle. And this is why she hates mages. Regalian apologizes for all mages ever, Cassandra gets teary and turns away, and I'm making fun of this part, but it's, it's probably the best character scene in the movie. I mean, it's not great, but it is something. The next morning, Templars surround the cave that our heroes came into, only to find them not there. When the other Templars leave, Night Commander Martell uses the Elven Stone to tell Fenric that Cassandra and Regalian are still missing, revealing himself to be part of the conspiracy. But a rock shoots out from the dark, knocking the stone from his hand as Cassandra puts her sword to his throat. Regalian, who seemed to have made them invisible, reads the runes on the stone with Fenric's reply, which I guess that means the Night Commander uses text-to-speech. Cool. Then Martell attacks. A fight happens, Cassandra seems to be losing, but then Regalian creates a caven, blocking them from Martell. Cassandra wants to kill him for revenge for the death of Byron, but Regalian tells him that they need to save the Chantry first. 
We got to a Vexus having drank more dragon's blood, and Fenric saying that whatever they were doing is now complete. Vexus can now control multiple dragons, and they control a Vexus. We're back at Cassandra being angry at grass and Regalian sending a message by Pigeon. Cassandra eventually opens up a convenient tunnel in the ground that leads to High Seeker's office, and in they go. When they get there, they loudly knock over a bookcase to find the High Seeker. He's actually pretty chill about the whole thing, saying that he's been waiting for a report and that she must have ran off for a reason. We cut to a few minutes later, presumably after they have explained. Regalian hands over the same elven stone with proof of the Night Commander's involvement. I see her Aldrin takes the stone, saying that he must take it to the Divine and praises Cassandra for a job well done. He tells them to wait here until his return, telling them to rest. Then he leaves. But, oh no! He's killed by Knight Commander Martell with Cassandra's sword! I, I really don't know how he got out of that cave, but that doesn't seem to matter. He calls in the Seekers then, saying that Cassandra just murdered the High Seeker. They grab Cassandra as she starts yelling the truth. We cut to a chantry as Martell walks into a confessional box, with Grand Cleric Callista on the other side. He tells her that he has murdered the High Seeker and framed Cassandra. She touches his face and smiles. She's in on it too! Oh my god, who would have guessed? He tells her that Fenric is also ready with the Vexus, and their plan to make her divine is ready. They also talk on how they plan to double-cross Fenric after their plan is finished. We cut again to the Divine, shocked to find that Cassandra killed the High Seeker, but enough of that, it's time for the Ten Year Gathering! In the dungeon, we see Cassandra and Regalian chained up. Martell comes to do the classical explain the evil plan part, that Fenric will use a Vexus to make dragons attack and kill the Divine. Regalian then puts together that he must have a Grand Cleric in this plan, as everyone will see the Divine and the other Grand Clerics killed. Cassandra asks who it is, but Martell just leaves, saying that they're about to die anyway, so they don't need to know. Looking over the gathering, Fenric and Avexus stand in a weirdly unguarded upper part of the Grand Cathedral. He gives some cheesy speech about entering a new era, and we see ten different, what I'm assuming to be, Grand Clerics making their appearance, and the Divine standing on top of a great pillar. Meanwhile, Cassandra and Regalian are about to be executed, but he notices someone from above. Martell wants to take over the execution himself, before he can kill Cassandra, and mages jump and attack to save both of them. They are the ones who Regalian sent his messenger bird to. A mage who is actually named Alte, but we don't actually learn this in the movie, informs them that they trailed the Knight Commander and learned that the Grand Cleric, who is the traitor, is the one from Orlais, which is Callista. Martell attacks him, but this time Cassandra is fully healed and defeats him. But before killing him... Hate can only breed more hate. But then he tries to kill her, and then she kills him anyway, so, like, who cares? The bell then rings, signaling the start of the gathering. The Divine starts her speech, and soon the dragons attack. And here is honestly where the movie just gets wild. Soon the Grand Clerics are actually eaten, Callista stands back and watches, just for fun I guess. Dragons begin to knock down towers, and the Divine is trapped on top of one of them. Regalian goes off to find Fenric and Avexus, while Cassandra drops on top of a dragon, which she crashes to the ground, killing it. When another dragon comes by, she hops on that one too. Back to Fenric, he tells Avexus to call the High Dragon. It comes, breathes fire, and looms towards the Divine, but then Regalian is able to get Avexus, who I guess passed out at one point. As the dragon closes in on the Divine, she opens up her arms to accept her fate, I guess, but Cassandra is able to steer the dragon. She is riding to collide with the High Dragon, saving the Divine. The two dragons also tumble right into the building Callista is standing on. More Seekers are able to finally get the Divine to get her to safety while Cassandra runs off to continue fighting. We jump back to Regalian and Fenric who have a quick mage off. Callista calls out to Fenric, Cassandra yells that Martell is dead, Callista stumbles to Fenric for help, whatever, but he kills her. And we get this really weird shot of her corpse that's like a little weirdly sexual. This is, th th this is creepy to me. But anyway, now that that's over, Fenric stabs himself for blood magic uses and turns into a pride demon, which is probably honestly the coolest bit of animation in this whole movie so far. We get a magic battle with the demon, it doesn't really do anything. Cassandra tries to attack it, but it doesn't actually do anything either. But then the high dragon attacks the pride demon. Vexus is awake and controlling it. We get a demon and dragon fight which ends in a giant explosion, our heroes only surviving thanks to magical shields. But the demon is still alive. Cassandra says a part of the chant and she drops onto the demon, killing it, but also falling from a great height. But who cares, she's alive! For the Chantry! For the Chantry! For the Chantry! Yeah! Later, Regalian and Cassandra have a moment. You are the bravest person I've ever met, and the most beautiful. 
This isn't the time or the place. <laughs> you fool. <laughs> Galleon, you've helped me win back more than just my honor. Suddenly, the world is different for me now. The door then opens to a cheering crowd as our heroes are joined by Happy Avexus. The Divine then meets them, who awards Cassandra the title of the Hero of Orlay and becomes the right hand to the Divine. And Regalian is cool too, but not cool enough for any awards, I guess. Finally, later in the Chantry, Cassandra is praying. She hears the door open as the Divine tells her that the attack was only the beginning. She hands her the book that we now know to be a writ from the Divine, allowing her to start the Inquisition, and she asks how she is able to serve. Then the movie ends. Discussion. So let's talk about the voice acting. The English voice acting, at least. It's awkward. I think the actress for Cassandra does a good job trying to do the weird Navarran accent that Cassandra's actual voice actor does, but some of the other voices or line delivery is just awkward or seems really out of place. Uh, but then again, this is a problem that I have with a lot of dubbed over anime, and as these actors mainly work in anime, I'm not that surprised. So, I don't know. Let's also have a quick discussion of Seekers. First, this is the only media that lists the Seeker leader as the High Seeker, all others list it as the Lord Seeker. This is really nitpicky, but I don't know, maybe it's possible that the two are interchangeable names for the same position, or that they are actually two different things. Two, at least later in the series in Asunder, which, while released before this movie, production was well underway before then, the Templars are mystified by the Seekers. Seekers are supposed to have unique powers, and we don't really see any of that in this movie. Maybe Cassandra is very young in her training, but I still think it's a missed opportunity to see Cassandra's unique abilities and then also the dynamic between Templars and Seekers being a little bit more interesting than it is in the movie. The way the Chantry hierarchy is shown is also unique, I guess. The Grand Clerics are all gathered in the end, with Ten and Tolda in the movie, each having a different color. But for the life of me, I have no idea what each Grand Cleric is from. If this is an important meeting, then you would think they would all be there, but then you would think that there would also be more than 10 for all of Thetis. I just have a lot of questions about it and how this regional color code was never seen again. It's actually an interesting idea that I kind of like though. For Elden could be pink, given how Dragon Age Origins select, Kirkwall would be black, and then Orlay would be white, although the Grand Cleric of Orlay is in the movie is purple. I I don't know, the, the, this is an idea that seemed interesting in the movie and one of the better ones in here. Speaking of the Grand Cleric, I mentioned the names of the Grand Cleric, High Seeker, and Knight Commander, but they are never actually said in the movie, only the official website and credits. So fun facts. When Regalian and Cassandra are surrounded by golems and Darkspawn that are being mind controlled, I just have so many questions. We do know that Darkspawn can be manipulated by blood magic, but where did these blood mages get all of these ogres? Like ogres are supposed to be really rare. Darkspawn, how did they get so many? And also, how do blood mages control golems? And if they can, where did they get them? Golems are also supposed to be rare in Thetas. Something that bothered me about the whole plot was that High Seeker Aldrin was never actually involved. Remember, Byron thought he was, and so disobeyed his orders because he thought that Aldrin keeping the girl was a sign of something being wrong. But Byron was wrong. Byron had absolutely no proof that the blood mages were connected to a higher power other than the High Seeker not returning her to the circle. Byron actually got really lucky there was a real conspiracy because otherwise he just kidnapped a girl for no reason. <laughs> so at one point it mentions that something had happened in Kirkwall. Your mind might jump to the mage's uprising at the end of Dragon Age 2, but remember, this is many, many years before that. So then you ask, what is he actually referring to? Well, about a year before this movie takes place, the Viscount of Kirkwall becomes paranoid that the Chantry will overthrow him, so he kills the Kirkwall Knight Commander. This event would also be the catalyst who would put Meredith as the leader of the Kirkwall Templars. So what he's saying is it's not actually about the mages versus Templar that the new era is supposed to be about, but that the Chantry being the ruler over everything. Let's also take a moment to talk about Avexis, because despite being a very major character, she basically amounts to an object. She literally has no lines other than gasps. She has almost no emotions other than looking happy at the end. She's just there and is usually knocked out. So in the credits to at least the English version, there is actually a Seether song called Desire and Need. On Funimation's YouTube page, you can actually see the band perform in a 
dated rendition of a chantry, complete with an actress dressed up as Cassandra before it delves into scenes from the movie. The song itself seems like your typical Seether song, and from my limited knowledge of the band, the song wasn't made for the movie, but remixed a bit for it. And by that, I mean there are technically two different versions, and this one is just slightly different than the actual version. So on the Funimation YouTube page, there are actually two production update videos. The first one isn't that exciting, but the second one has a lot of, I don't know, good quotes, I'm going to say. The main thing I want to bring up is how Cassandra actually looks. She looks almost alien to how we know her today, but the production update shows concept art of her that makes the movie make a lot more sense. Also, for your viewing pleasure, some of the highlights of the production updates. She is specifically tied to a, a family that was notorious for being the best dragon hunters in the entire world of Ferelden. And then, obviously, we wanted to make sure that she was hot. Previously, we've showed mages as either terrified, apostates, or menacing characters. And Galleon is more comfortable with his abilities. So the players may have a chance to interact with characters like Galleon, Cassandra may reappear, the Divine. I've always said that Dragon Age 2 is the game that pushes the world to the brink of war. And I think in the future, we're gonna see things fall off the edge. So with all of my comments on the movie itself, what actually happens to these characters? Well, Divine Beatrix III dies around the end of Dragon Age 2 with Divine Justini V taking over, and we know how well that turned out. First Enchanter Edmund is actually the same First Enchanter in Asunder, where he later dies. Vexus is made tranquil, surprising absolutely no one. Honestly, considering how she is acted in this movie, tranquility oddly suits her. You can supposedly find her in Dragon Age Inquisition walking around Haven. While she doesn't actually say her name, there is a tranquil that mentions being fond of animals and having talked to dragons, and a tweet by the devs that hinted at they are indeed the same person. As she is not seen in Skyhold, it's possible that she died during the attack on Haven. Regalian and Cassandra would go on to be in a romantic relationship for some time, but would eventually break up. Regalian himself would be at the Conclave and died. And literally no one else for this movie shows up later in the series, minus Cassandra herself, who obviously pays a major part in Dragon Age Inquisition. So what are my thoughts on this movie? Frankly, I don't like it. Uh, I know that's a shock. Part of that really just has to do with me just being really not that fond of anime, but this doesn't really feel that much like Dragon Age either. As I said before, the series, to me, is about emotional conflicts, but this focuses more on the world and the plot to kill the divine. It does have its moments where it does feel like it could be Dragon Age, and moments where even if it's not, it's still fun. But it's just not a great movie. This this is definitely a movie you watch with your friends with a couple of beers and just kind of make fun of it the entire time and enjoy the dragons. But I think it's honestly worth one watch if you are a devoted fan, but that's that's about it. If you aren't, I honestly think Cassandra has the best summary of the events in total. So you were the right hand to the Divine? To Divine Justinia, yes. And Divine Beatrix before her, in fact. The position is normally reserved for Templars of the Knights Divine, but my circumstances were unusual. Unusual how? You don't know the story? Thank the Maker. I will tell you if you wish. But it isn't as exciting as some drum it up to be. The short version is that I once saved the previous Divine's life. My reward was becoming her right hand. So what's the story about you becoming the right hand? Sweet Andraste, do you really want to hear that? It was, what, 18, 20 years ago? Some still discuss it like it happened yesterday. The tale gets bigger each time it's told. I barely recognize myself within it now. You're stalling. To hear others tell it, I alone saved Divine Beatrix from a horde of dragons sent to assault the Grand Cathedral. Rather impressive for such a young seeker, wouldn't you say? And the truth is? I stumbled upon a conspiracy to kill Beatrix. A Templar Knight Commander was at its heart. And there was a dragon battle at the Grand Cathedral, but I had help from loyal mages who rallied to the cause. They freed the dragons from magical control. Without them, the Divine and I would both have died. Yet I became the right hand, and they are forgotten. What happened to the mages that helped you? They went back to their circles, with rewards and privileges and most holy gratitude. Many of them died at the conclave. That's rather typical of the Chantry, isn't it? Even worse, few know of the Knight Commander's involvement at all. That sort of willful blindness needs to change. And that, dear patrons, is all that we know on the first and 
probably last Dragon Age movie. You still have lingering questions, proof that I'm wrong, comments about your own fan theory. Feel free to tweet me at Eckgildathon on Twitter or send a PM to user Gilanon on Reddit. Dresh Sheral.